Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. One of the big advancements of the 21st century is just how easy it is for us to communicate with each other. We've got broadband internet pretty much everywhere we go, even when we're out in the middle of nowhere with our smartphones here. We can make video calls, all sorts of cool stuff. The problem is all of this great communication technology falls apart when a tree takes out fiber optic lines or your power's out for an extended period of time. And after that, it gets very difficult for you as an individual to communicate your status out to loved ones and other folks who might need to come and help you. So what I thought we would do in this video is take a look at some advancements lately in consumer technology that allows you to communicate even when everything else falls apart. And at the end of the video, we'll also talk a little bit about amateur radio and why if you are a technically savvy person, you might want to consider getting a license not only to help yourself, but also your loved ones and your neighbors that might be nearby. Let's get to it. Now, today's video, as always, is being brought to you by all of you. That includes everyone who watches these videos on a regular basis, along with those of you who contribute to the channel on a regular basis, either through my donor box page at lon.tv support or through Patreon, Floatplane, or the YouTube membership program. I greatly appreciate everything that you do to keep this channel going. And now let's get into today's topic, which I think you might find pretty interesting. Now, I do want to acknowledge the tragedy that folks in the southern United States have experienced with Hurricane Helene. One of those impacted is LGR, a popular retro YouTuber. His home was significantly damaged by the storm. As you can see here, some trees came down uh, right into his home. Thankfully, he's fine and his family and friends are okay. Uh, but many in his area are suffering greatly due to flooding down trees, power being out, no communications coverage. It is a significantly uh, difficult time for folks down there. And I will put a link to the charity that Clint LGR is recommending people contribute to that will help his friends and neighbors get back up on their feet. Uh, he's doing fine, but many people down there are not. Uh, so if you're able to, definitely consider making a contribution. Now here in Connecticut, we've had our share of bad weather over the years, not as bad as what they experienced down south, but we have a pretty bad power company here that did not keep up with their infrastructure. So although we had relatively minor storms as tropical uh, cyclones are concerned, we had significant multi-day outages. And in recent memory, we've had six different storms hit us that knocked power out for over a week. And when your power's out for even a day or two, everything starts to fail that relies on the utility delivering electricity. So one of the first things to go down is your cable modem because those cable modems rely on the power supplies that sit on the poles that power the cable nodes for the coax connection. When those power supplies lose the charge in their backup batteries, that's it, you're done. You're not communicating until they bring over the portable generators that they have to plug in to power these things. There was one year where Comcast didn't have enough of these generators and they were basically charging the batteries, moving the generator someplace else and plugging it back in. It was a game of whack-a-mole trying to keep customers online because the power company took so long to get the lights back on again. And then when you think about your smartphone and that it communicates wirelessly, that's true, but you're not communicating to satellites most of the time. We'll talk about an exception to that in a second. Most of the time you're communicating with a tower that's nearby. This is one that's not far from my house. And those towers are fed by fiber optic cables. So if the cables are damaged, that tower is not working. So you can have a perfectly functional tower, but if the fiber optic cables, which sit on the pole, just like your cable connection does get damaged, you have to wait for those repairs to get made before you can start communicating with your smartphone again. And I'm sure that's something that's impacting issues down south. I will give kudos though to Verizon Wireless in my area. They do a very good job of making sure they have robust backup power at most of their cell towers. So you can see they have a nice big uh, propane tank there, it looks like, uh, for their generators. And in those instances where we did lose power over long durations, uh, we did not have fiber optic damage and Verizon service was able to work throughout, even though it got a little overloaded because everybody switched to Verizon for all of their communications, including internet. But it was good to see uh, that they were able to at least keep things going. Some of their competitors, though, don't have backup generation. And so many other folks with smartphones lost all communications altogether. And you can also just see here just how poorly maintained these poles are by the utilities. And there's a lot of stuff growing off of that one, which at some point could put those wires at risk. So 
How do you prepare these days for something that might impact your ability to communicate? Well, the good news is we're seeing a lot of progress in a couple of areas uh, with technology that you may already have, along with things that you can get now for a relatively affordable price, especially if you live in a rural area where you might uh, have one of these things happen to your neck of the woods and knock you out for a while. The first one I want to talk about is something Apple implemented a couple of years ago on the iPhone. It started as Emergency SOS, and this is something that works on the iPhone 14 and later. And what this started as was an ability for you to send an emergency message via satellite without using any special antennas to let people know that you might be stuck somewhere and need help. It would just send those messages to the authorities and get uh, someone out to your location. In the recent version of iOS, iOS 18, they have expanded this satellite feature to allow you to send messages to everybody else that you need to. And so this is a neat feature that if everything else fails and you just want to let a relative know that you're okay, you can now communicate over satellite. And there is a way that you can practice how to use this, which I would suggest you do before this happens. Let me show you how to do that. Now I found the quickest way to set up the practice mode here is to pull down your control center here, and then you'll have all of your communication stuff in one of these widgets here. And if you just tap on it and go over to satellite, you can summon the demo mode. I would suggest doing this outside because this doesn't work when you are inside. Uh, but once you get that demo mode activated, it will actually go out and start looking for a satellite. So a little bit earlier, I went out into my driveway here and set up the demo mode and it uh, figured out where it was. And then it tells you which direction to point the phone to make that connection to the satellite. Now, in this case, you're not sending any messages, but it is actually doing a two-way communication to the satellite that is overhead. Now, the number of satellites in the constellation that Apple is using for this feature are not as numerous as the Starlink network is. So every time you run the demo, you'll find your satellite in a different spot. Sometimes you have to wait a minute or two for it to come up over the horizon, but it's generally there when you need it. And I really would suggest trying this feature out ahead of time so you understand how it works and can be prepared should you ever need to use it. Now on the Android side, Google has a feature on the new Pixel 9 phone that is very similar to this. So that's available on the Pixel side. T-Mobile has partnered with Starlink and they are putting uh, basically cell towers on a number of Starlink satellites that will allow you to directly communicate over the T-Mobile network with your phone without having to do anything different and that will be happening soon. So it's very encouraging to see all of these new options that give you the ability to get help even if there's no infrastructure working nearby because you got a satellite overhead that you can communicate with. So definitely educate yourself as to what options you have available on your phone and test it out so you know how to use it. And of course we have to talk about Starlink. They have a new product called the Starlink Mini. It costs about $600 and it is a fully self-contained product in that you've got the dish and the router in one device. So when you plug it into power, it will connect to the satellites but also advertise a Wi-Fi hotspot that you can use to connect your devices to the Starlink dish and you are communicating. The bandwidth on these is exceptional for a satellite communication device. You get anywhere from 15 to 20 megabits per second upstream and about 200 megabits per second downstream, more than enough to make phone calls and check in on loved ones. And the best part is, is that you can take the service on a month to month basis. So I have an older Starlink dish in my basement here. I haven't touched it in years, but if I ever need to, I can put it out in the backyard and immediately reactivate my account and get service if everything else is down around here. So if you are in an area where you are concerned you might lose communication over a long period of time, Starlink is definitely something to consider. If you don't need a little all-in-one solution, the other dish they have is less expensive, the standard kit, and I think they're having a sale at Starlink's website right now on refurbished units as well. So these are a great option. It is a, an outstanding internet connection and you really can't go wrong with this. Now, all of these satellite solutions we've talked about have required some kind of infrastructure to operate, but there's one technology that doesn't and that is amateur radio. I recently got my amateur radio license. I am a licensed general. My call sign is KC1RGS here in the US and I am allowed to operate on a number of frequencies and perhaps help my community if needed. Uh, to communicate out to get help if 
that is something that is required. And if you're interested in how amateur radio is addressing the current situation in North Carolina, if you go to lon.tv slash W4HTP, you can actually listen to how amateur radio operators are helping to organize aid and support to residents that are impacted by this storm. A lot of what they're dealing with here are not necessarily emergency situations, but you've got people who need water or food, and they're able to direct that through this network that they've set up. Additionally, there's a lot of people outside the area that are trying to get in touch with loved ones who have no way to communicate right now, so they can reach the operator of this network who can then send people out to check on them. So this is a way that amateur radio is still quite relevant today. And a little bit earlier, I did a live stream with my friend Kyle. His call sign is Alpha Alpha Zero Zulu, A-A-Zero-Z. And he has a great YouTube channel if you're looking to learn more about amateur radio. And we did a number of experiments the other night uh, where we did some long distance communications just using the radio. So I am in Connecticut. He's in St. Louis, Missouri. And we started off with just a simple voice chat over the radio. Have a listen. Turn the volume up here on the radio. Kilo Charlie One, Romeo Golf Sierra. So as you can hear, it is a little staticky, but you can very easily make a communication between two people across the country from each other pretty much here. I've been able to reach people as far as Asia with my radio here with a pretty lousy antenna. So it's quite possible to get the word out well beyond your particular area. And it's more than just voice. So what we also did during our stream was experiment with a couple of different digital technologies where I could send a message from me to him and have that re message read out perfectly like a text message would. And there's a bunch of different ways in which you can send text back and forth over the radio. Some are a little bit slower than others. None of them are very quick. But if you just need to get the word out that you need help or that you're OK, uh, these are technologies that can deliver those messages very, very quickly without any need for any infrastructure anywhere. And the frequencies that a lot of these digital networks operate on are well known and well monitored. So you don't have to hunt around in the dial to see if somebody is listening. Now you can also send emails to anyone who has an email address on the internet over the radio using an application called WinLink. So the way this would work is that if your local internet is down, you can compose an email and connect to a WinLink server over the radio that's farther away that has access to the internet, and that message can get out. Likewise, the messages can get passed from one WinLink server to the other over the radio until it gets to a point where there's an active internet connection and it can be delivered. So what I've done right here if I, is I've addressed an email to a regular email address along with some text here. I'm going to post it to my outbox. And just like the good old days of dial-up internet, it sits in the outbox until you make a connection to transmit it. So I'm going to open a session here and connect up to my local WinLink server that's about 25 or 30 miles away here. And as you can see here, this is going pretty quickly because I am communicating over a VHF connection which runs at 1200 baud. But I can also send these emails halfway across the world using high frequency bands that can go further. Um, but here we've got the active connection here. That's my email going out. And then we'll get a confirmation back from the server that my email was successfully received and will now work its way through the WinLink network here. So now we've got that uh, email distributed. We have disconnected from the server. And this will take a minute or two, but I've got a little email receiving box here from a service called Mailinator, which is pretty fun. And there, oh, there it is already. So the message has come in, and that was the message that we sent out over the radio that then got routed through the WinLink network. So this can be a very useful tool because, of course, you can actually send text messages to smartphones just by uh, typing in whatever the carrier's special email address is for that phone. So there's a lot of ways that you can make use of this technology. And if you become an amateur radio operator, Typically, there's a group in your area that practices using WinLink to send different types of messages. They've got a lot of templates already inside of the WinLink application for storm reporting and other things. And we have a little thing around my area called WinLink Wednesday, uh, where we compose an, a message to somebody that's involved with this to keep our skills sharp. And I just sent one in the other day and got a response here from 
the guy that I sent it to. So good stuff here. If you're able to get an amateur radio license, take a look at doing it because I think it'll be a great skill to have should all of the infrastructure in your area stop working. So there you go, some examples of how you can communicate even when the infrastructure falls apart. I am very encouraged by the work that Apple, Google, and SpaceX are doing to bring satellite communications directly to phones. That is going to make a big difference in helping people get help when there's no other communication options available. But again, if you are technically savvy, I think that amateur radio license is definitely worth considering. And I've got a lot of content on how I got my license down below in the video description. That'll do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching.